Okay, so um, it's, I, I hope the sound is all right, and um, I want to tell you something about the design of printed circuit boards. Um, to those who are not familiar with uh, circuit boards, I'll give a short introduction uh, on the history and the evolution of printed circuit boards, and uh, especially because I think it's significant some technical aspects on the exchange format used to uh, transfer uh, layout data have a look at the design aspect beyond the pure functional design and I want to show some experiments I did and let's see if this is something interesting. So when researching this talk I was basically looking in an online forum for uh, electrical engineers and was uh, t telling a bit about what I'm going to do and one of the responses I got I found striking because he said believe it or not I'm genuinely interested to hear what you find out but I'm afraid I think you may be looking for ideas and inspiration in a pretty dry empty place sorry so um, obviously this person um, in his career has focus on the functionality over the design aspect and the functionality I think has some inherent beauty but uh, the, uh, the to make nice looking board is not necessarily in the target in the goal among the goals for the design and um, I must say I don't buy his uh, approach I think he is somewhat limited by routine routine blindness and um, yeah, even when not focusing on that, um, there are tons of implicit, implicit patterns and some sort of beauty in the design of uh, PCBs. So, yeah, and uh, especially nice things happen when enthusiasts uh, do their own PCBs in, in their free time and they're investing vast amounts of energy in, into the beauty aspect of the design and I want to showcase at least some of it this but mostly I'm focusing on industrial uh, design so why PCBs at all this is uh, from, uh, from an old TV monitor from 1963 and you see that it has a vastly different appearance than the electronics you're used today uh, used to today and um, this kind of highlights uh, what problem PCBs are designed to solve you have some random stacks of components there needed some delicate soldering to get them together they need to produce the correct schematics and it's tricky to handle uh, you see the, it's really a mastership in uh, creating something like this you need to have an idea about the soldering as well as the electrical ideas behind it and yeah so this doesn't really help when you try to produce mass produce cheap stuff so one of the first attempts looked like this this is a so-called cordwood circuit and it's to try to get a better uh, reliability for the PCB and if you have a look a closer look here you also already see something like a trace um, yeah, which uh, later will become the PCB. So this is some experimental PCB uh, which is done by the company Tektronics. It's pre-1966, it's not exactly clear when this has been designed and uh, this is one of the first attempts to, to improve the real reliability and the production speed of their devices, in this case an os oscilloscope. We'll later have a look at some of the details on that. So, um, another aspect was that uh, PCBs uh, in the beginning focused on small components. So you had like a module that gets plugged in somewhere, this might be a PCB. In this case it's a so-called flip chip technology from a PDB-10. Um, the year is 1971 and yeah, it's a small module with a few components on it but you already can see that it's way more organized than uh, the first one we saw. So these modules got plugged in into a so-called backplane and the backplane from the other side looked like this. So 
This is from 1975, so you'd see the, the PCB production really did take a while until it really arrived in the market. Um, this is done with some semi-automatic wire wrap with twisted pairs, so you see that the individual strands of the wires are actually two wires uh, intertwined. And um, yeah, it was done with a huge amount of automation already. So you had wire instructions on a punched card or a punch tape. And yeah, this is how this was created. And it obviously worked good enough for quite a while. But it wasn't cheap, definitely not. So this is from 1969. And you see that the look you associate with PCBs um, already is there. You have this, these distinct 45 degree angles, you have <coughs> various components bridging over other um, uh, traces. And yeah, I think this already looks quite modern, although it is from the end of the 60s. And yeah, I didn't ex actually, I didn't expect that at that, that time. So, how are PCBs produced? Uh, these are screenshots from an old educational movie, also done by Tektronix. Uh, basically, you had a clear uh, film, and you had pre-made symbols you would stick on the film, and then this guy actually uses a roll, you can see it here, roll of sticky tape to create a trace between the correct pads. So this work usually was done in an upscaled version like 2 to 1 or 4 to 1 and oops and then you got in and tweaked basically here he is cutting the uh, the pads because they are too tight too close to the trace in between and so they got cut a little bit and lifted off so it was a very um, hands or, or down-to-earth manipulation of physical things you would put together and create a photographic film that's later used in the production. Um, wait. So yeah, this is tweaking and then the, the film gets photographically reduced and you use photosensitive materials to shape the areas uh, of the copper base material uh, to protect it from etching. This guy actually is using an, a pantograph drilling machine to place holes in the correct locations. And of course, relatively early there was were attempts to automate this, so this is um, Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. Ah. Something is wrong here. Okay, so uh, pantograph drilling machine. Uh, so you can drill holes at the correct locations with a high precision. And yes, automation was quite early. This is also in the movie from 1969. Um, and it uh, is, uses punch tape to have instructions, for example, for the drilling machine. So later, um, they invented a so-called photo plotter, um, made by Java Scientific. It's basically a wheel of apertures, which you control in a controlled manner. Uh, points light at a film, so you can use it for uh, exposing the film. So you can have numerically controlled uh, high precision film. So um, this is the command language and I won't bore you with the details. Um, basically the interesting point is you can have straight lines and circular segments. You don't have Bézier's, which from a point nowadays is quite a pity because this is still the format used for exchanging the data. Um, to highlight the differences, this is a board manually routed, it's a ZX81, the first edition, and I want to highlight the smooth shapes, and the third edition looked like this, so obviously there has been a change in the way how it was manufactured, because this definitely is CAD use. 
this is Amiga 500. Uh, here you can see that there are curves instead of hard uh, corners. This is from an Apple Macintosh SE. Um, here you see the typical 45 degree angles. Yeah, and I think this really is beautiful. It comes from a, a highly technical uh, demand. And yeah, but the outcome has a very specific aesthetic I like a lot. So the point is, uh, PCBs are used for a function. In this case, basically uh, <laughs> carrying components. <laughs> it's a lot of small SMD components. Um, and here you see, if, if you look at these wiggly things, these things have a purpose. They're intended for length matching of the traces um, so that high speed signals can be transferred with a high reliability. Um, again, something utterly beautiful, but not created for its beauty. And again, this is not an attempt that someone draw ventilators or something like that. <laughs> uh, this is basically HF voodoo. So if you are working with very high frequency signals, these kind of traces can act as a filter. I don't have any idea how this works. It's really voodoo. <laughs> so this is what a PCB looks like. Uh, if you have a cross section, in this case, it, it is a four layer PCB. Uh, the copper areas are shaped with a photographic, pro, uh, photographic process followed by some etching. Yeah, and it's called a four layer PCB because it actually consists of 11 layers. Uh, so it's uh, some silk screen pr printing, um, some solar resist in between, some copper layers, and actually the count of the copper layers is the relevant thing. So if you have a look here, here is a, there is the topmost copper layer, intermediate copper layer, and another intermediate copper layer, and the down copper layer. The interesting thing is that this can be produced with a very high uh, precision, and the copper can be gold plated, and the top three layers, top four layers, are relevant for the visible artwork. So, if you actually look at the tools used to design this stuff, they're not really equipped to deal with graphical content. They are focusing on the electrical signals. And so yeah, uh, the limits, especially when looking at fonts, uh, are there are severe limits. Um, basically, fonts are constructed from straight lines. Uh, this was not always the case, especially if you look back in history. This is, again, the ZX81. And it has a beautiful font, a silk screen printed on top of it. So this is something that at some point happened when CAT has been introduced. So this is about this time. Um, obviously, the font looks quite ugly, straight lines cobbled together. Uh, but even here, there's some attempt at doing a logo artwork uh, in case of the Commodore logo. So yeah, and dealing with graphics is cumbersome with these tools. I'm looking at the Eagle tool later. Um, there are open source uh, alternatives, but they share the same restrictions. Uh, I'll skip over this now because it's quite, I'm a little bit in a hurry. Um, so this is the early PCB I showed. There is an attempt at the logo uh, etching. This is done, obviously, with a photographic process. And it has quite a high detail. Although this is over etched, it's too much copper removed in the etching process. Again, logo Apple, of course, <laughs> um, has put some efforts into sh uh, producing a nice PCB. Yeah, uh, let's just skip that. And this is what enthusiasts can do. If you have a close look, uh, this is the Hypnotode from Futurama. Um, and the traces are designed to recreate the shape and of this iconic toad. Um, and it actually is a, synth a synthesizer that creates the drone sound. <laughs> This is something I did, and this is where it actually all started. My experience started. This is uh, from a small Blinken Light simulator, if you're familiar with the Blinken Light project. Um, this is a black and white replica of the freeze on the actual house des Lehrers in Berlin. Um, yeah, and it's realized by um, solid copper. Um, 
gold plated and uh, then a dark violet solder mask is put on top of that and um, yeah that turned out quite nice and if you need a scale it's 32 millimeters wide so let's have a look at the, at the workflow let's take a black and white bitmap um, there are scripts available to import these bitmaps into the uh, layout to this is a screenshot from Eagle and you see that the bitmap R act is replicated using straight lines so you see the distinct uh, stairs stair step pattern and you have a ton of lines in your design which uh, make it harder to actually produce the PCB because there are certain steps which involve checks if the lines are correct and having this amount of individual lines makes that harder um, as well as you can't get to arbitrary high resolutions because there is a minimum trace width you have to respect. So yeah, you get this rasterized appearance. So my attempt basically was look at the primitives and we only have uh, circular segments uh, while the graphics world basically relies on BCA curves. So to one thing you can do is approximate uh, Bezier curves with circular segments and this is what I did here. Um, so you need quite a lot of segments to, uh, to approximate this simple Bezier. So this is the outcome. Uh, there are some additional tricks I did here. Um, basically the shape is uh, are straight lines. It's, it's a filled polygon and filling is happening automatically in the workflow. So it looks like this. And you see that the text is a little bit too fat. So <coughs> the next thing I did was to reduce the shapes, uh, shrink the shapes. Actually, I did it in the wrong order here. Um, and uh, split up the holes because eagle polygons may not, may not have uh, holes. So this is the second attempt and I think this looks quite better. Um, a last look since we are really short on time on, on text. Um, this is how text properties are looking like in Eagle. Um, we have lots of straight lines and the text in my opinion is not really nice. Is it visible? Yeah. So KiCad, the open source alternative, is doing slightly better. They, they still have a font constructed from straight lines, but um, they have way more lines making it nice, nice round shapes. So I wrote this Python thing to try to construct a font from purely circles, uh, circular segments. And this is what I did to uh, actually match the shape of lines with some original font. In this case, it is based on Droid Sans. Um, yeah, and when you use this, with lots of tricks and lots of annoyances, you can get something like this. And the nice thing is it's constructed from circular segments and the amount of segments is not that much increased. It's, but it's a manual process. You need to do manual design of the uh, text and yeah. So that's about it. I could show you the tool in action uh, if time permits, but we can also start with questions. So question or demo? Question. <laughs> Uh, did you look at uh, did you look at uh, Fritzing? No. Because they actually have uh, import. You can import arbitrary bitmaps, and it'll rasterize them. And I think the implementation is a really similar to what uh, I would have to look, have a look. And it does SVGs as well. And then it tries to if the paths will fit the Gerber, then it uses that. Um, it might be worth looking at. Yeah, and also, uh, obviously. Yeah. Second question. Nobody. Okay. So, Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>